I couldn't stand hearing her screams of agony. I wasn't like my buddy Thomas. I didn't derive any pleasure from the pain of others like he did. It was actually quite disturbing. It never failed to make my skin crawl and my stomach churn to see that sadistic smile appear on his face when he started torturing someone. There was something seriously wrong with the way the spark plugs in his brain fired. Don't get me wrong though, he was a pretty decent guy once you got to know him, but he was a nightmare for those who didn't. Thank God I met him back when we were kids. I mean, he was still dangerous back then, but the fact that he was a kid made him a lot easier to bond with. All it took was me sharing my lunches with him. I was a wimpy kid back in the day and got bullied a lot, but when I became friends with Thomas, no bully dared to fuck with me. If one foolishly did, they would have had to answer to Thomas and he would have been sure to make an example of them for future fools. We were only eight at the time, but Thomas had a real mean streak in him back then. A mean streak that's only cultivated and grown more volatile with time. It's been 30 years since Thomas and I became friends, but only five since he made me his accessory in crime. It all started when he spotted an attractive young college chick he'd been eyeing for a while at our favorite bar. It took him some time to get his courage up, but when he did, he approached her while she was with several of her friends. The woman coldly shot him down, embarrassing him in front of the whole bar, or at least that's how he saw it. The young woman had no way of knowing it then, but as she laughed with her friends over drinks and made further fun of Thomas, Thomas watched her from across the bar with a look of malice that I knew all too well. I knew right then and there that this was going to be trouble, but what I didn't have the slightest clue of was to how extreme things would get that night. Thomas borrowed my car later on that night, but when he showed up at my house later on to drop it back off, he wasn't alone. When he told me to come outside to help him carry something in, I initially thought it might have been something cool he picked up from alongside the road or near a dumpster. We always did shit like that. The last thing I ever expected to see when he popped the trunk was the unconscious body of the same young college girl who embarrassed him at the bar. I was dead set against whatever he may have had planned from that very second. I told him I wanted no parts of what he was doing. I even tried to convince him to let her go before things got even more out of control. When I refused to help him, he lifted her out of the trunk, threw her over his shoulder, and carried her down into my basement. You see, I lived in a secluded house in the woods, and it didn't dawn on me then, but now I know that that was the primary reason why he brought her there. Seclusion. The things he did to her that night nauseated me so badly I threw up as I raced from the crime scene, which just so happened to be my damn basement, and ran out the back door to finish spewing up what was left of my meatloaf TV dinner. I'll never forget how our blood-curdling screams filled the atmosphere and completely drowned out what would have normally been the relaxing sounds of nature. He went on raping and torturing that poor girl for the entire weekend, and every time I found myself having to leave the house to take a deep walk into the surrounding woods to get away from the disturbing mixture of her screams and his laughing and taunting. When I got back to my cabin about an hour later on a Sunday afternoon, Thomas was smoking a cigarette on the porch, sitting in my rocking chair. He looked totally at peace. Nothing at all like a man who'd been savaging another human being for the past two and a half days. When I stepped onto the porch, he immediately asked me where I kept my shovel. I knew then what he was planning to do, if he hadn't already done it. I didn't have to even think about it twice. I mean, I knew the chances of him letting her go were slim to none, but in the back of my mind I held out hope that he would show some form of compassion and let the girl go. But when he asked for my shovel, with that deadpan look of his, I knew what he was going to do. I said to him, you killed her, didn't you? In that moment, I saw for the first time ever how truly heartless my best friend was when he callously answered, well yeah, I gotta be back at work tomorrow. That bitch served her purpose. Next time we'll have to get you one too. I was so distracted by the fact that he killed the young woman that his words went completely over my head. The next time. Like he planned on doing this twisted shit again. I didn't know if he was kidding or serious, but when he unexpectedly arrived at my cabin three weeks later, late on a Friday night with another unconscious female in his trunk, I knew that Pandora's box had been opened and Thomas's sick appetite for carnage had been unleashed. For the next five years, he hunted unsuspecting women like it was a sport. He stalked them like a lion stalks his prey, waiting for the perfect opportunity to capture them, then used them to satisfy his sadistic desires before discarding them like rotten pieces of meat. The grounds surrounding my property were littered with the unmarked graves of girls and women whose families would never know the truth of what happened to them or experience the mental and spiritual peace of being able to give their loved ones a proper burial. 
I know the smartest and in the very least the most decent thing I could have done was try to stop him or at least turn him into the police. But I couldn't dare bring myself to do that to the man who was like a brother to me. Thomas had looked out for me practically my whole life. What kind of friend would I be to turn on him after all he's done for me? And it should be known that I did try to stop him on several occasions in the beginning. I suggested often that he should stop before he got caught, but he wouldn't listen. So when I realized my words of caution were falling on arrogant ears, I gave up and decided to do the only moral thing left that I could think of. And what would be their final days on God's green earth? I would offer the poor unfortunate women the two things I felt they desperately needed. Comfort and compassion. It probably doesn't sound like much, but it was the best I could do. Whenever Thomas wasn't acting out his sick desires, I made sure the women had water, food, and blankets to keep them warm. I could tell they were terrified of me, but I did my best to get through to them that I wasn't anything like Thomas and that I would never hurt them. I doubt any of them believed me, but it's not like I could blame them for that. Regardless of how any of them perceived me, I remained a perfect gentleman and I did my very best to remind them that they were still human in spite of Thomas's savage treatment towards them. Things carried on this way for years, and as terrible as it sounds, I started to get used to it all. It was kind of like two detectives playing the good cop, bad cop role on a suspect. Only in our case, it was far more extreme with much graver consequences. Thomas was the devil, and I attempted to be the saint. Well, at least saintly. It wasn't what I wanted, but it was what I did to lighten my conscience. And for the most part, that was working for me. But that was only until Thomas arrived last night with his latest victim. I had grown tolerant to Thomas's proclivities of capturing young women and using them for his own sexual gratification. But what he brought to my cabin this Friday night, I was so fucking far from being cool with I nearly punched him. And I had never risen a fist to him before. In his trunk, bruised and unconscious, was a little girl who couldn't have been any older than 12 or 13 years old. Up until then, all of his selections were women in their early 20s to mid-30s, maybe a couple in their late teens, but never anyone this young. I'll never forget how small she looked as he carried her over his shoulder into the cabin, grinning fiendishly along the way. I listened to that child scream for hours. Normally I would take the coward's approach and leave the cabin so I wouldn't have to be subjected to the torture the women endured, but this time, I couldn't allow myself to turn a blind eye. If I had an ounce of courage, I would have gone down to the basement and put an end to whatever the hell was going on and took the little girl to the nearest hospital. Unfortunately, I didn't. The only thing I had the heart to do was to wait for Thomas to take his customary two to three hour break and go down into the basement to check on the young girl. She didn't look as physically battered as some of the other women would have by this point, but the fear in her eyes was just the same. I gave her water and offered her food, but she understandably didn't have an appetite. Obviously, she was petrified of me, but I assured her that I wouldn't hurt her. She pleaded for me to let her go, and with a heavy heart, I explained to her how I would love to let her go, but how Thomas would probably kill me if I did. She looked at me with terrified confusion, then began crying hysterically, screaming for me to let her go. I tried to quiet her down before she woke up Thomas, but it was too late. I could hear the floorboards creak over my head, which let me know that not only was he awake, but that he was now making his way towards the basement door. Thomas spent more time with that little girl than he had with any other woman he had captured. That bothered me a lot. The longer I sat in my room, listening to that little girl wail all throughout the night and again throughout the day, the more pinned up rage boiled inside of me. In between the long stretches of screams, I thought about how this might become a whole new trend for Thomas. I knew him just as well as I knew myself, and I knew that this wasn't going to be his youngest victim for very long if things kept up this way. I sat up all night long Saturday night leading into Sunday morning. This was going to be the day that Thomas looked to get rid of the little girl so he could head back into town that night and start preparing for the upcoming week. I thought long and hard about what I was going to do and I decided that if this was ever going to stop, I'd have to be the one to put an end to it. And if ever I was going to do something, I was going to have to do it now. So I waited until I knew Thomas was sound asleep on my sofa before I made my move. I went into my kitchen picked up the first thing I saw that looked suitable for my need, which just so happened to be a cast iron skillet. I walked back into the living room and took position directly over Thomas. I raised the skillet just over my head, and in that split second, Thomas woke up and our eyes connected. Before either of us could process anything, I brought the skillet down on his forehead with so much force it caved in. 
That blow alone probably killed him, but I still went on to pound the heavy skillet into his head over and over again until there was nothing left but an unrecognizable mass of blood, meat, and bone where his head once was. With the threat now eliminated, I felt the heavy weight lift off of me as I headed into the basement. The young girl was still tied to the bed and began whimpering the instant she heard the basement door open. I told her she didn't have to be scared anymore because I had just killed the bad man who'd been hurting her. I picked up a box cutter that was on my workbench and used it to cut the shaken girl free of the ropes that bound her. As I freed her hands, I told her I was going to take her straight to the hospital so they could fix her up and reunite her with her family. Those words seemed to calm her. Once her hands were free, I began cutting the ropes that were tied around her ankles. I had just freed her second ankle when I felt something hard hit me in the back of my head and neck. I fell to the floor and the little girl took off running up the stairs, screaming for help. I was dizzy as hell, but somehow managed to get back to my feet and stumble up the stairs. As I got to the top of the steps, the girl suddenly appeared and plunged a knife into my chest. The blade entered my body, creating an uncomfortable sensation of heat. I was in total shock. I stared into the wide, hate-filled eyes of the little girl and gasped. I only wanted to help you. The girl's young face took on a menacing glare as she said, Now you want to help me? You kidnap and torture me for days. And you want to help me? I couldn't understand what the hell she was talking about. Poor girl must have been traumatized. Finding it increasingly hard to take deep breaths, I told her, That wasn't me. That was Thomas. I killed him so he wouldn't hurt you anymore. The girl yanked the blade from my chest and the geyser of my blood spewed onto her shirt. She then yelled, You are Thomas, you sick fucker. You were the one hurting me. She violently shoved the knife into my chest again, then took off running out the front door. I was at a loss of words and blood. I staggered into the living room after pulling the knife from my chest. I dropped to the floor, directly beside the couch, trying to desperately understand the girl's final words to me. It didn't make any sense. But that's when I saw something that my fading mind found extremely troubling and befuddling. As I laid on the floor, surely dying, I realized that there wasn't a body on the couch that I had just bludgeoned Thomas to death on only minutes ago. Not only that, but there wasn't a single drop of blood anywhere other than the pool that was slowly forming around me. I used the last bit of strength I had to grab a silver tray off the coffee table and stare straight into it. To my horror, the foggy reflection I saw on the tray's reflective surface was Thomas's. I couldn't believe it. But the more I slipped away, the more everything cleared. You hear about people who said their life flashed before their eyes when faced with impending death. Well, I experienced the exact same thing, and in those fleeting seconds, I had a clarity like never before. All that time I thought I was being a saint to those poor women, when in actuality, I was the fucking devil himself. I was Thomas, and Thomas was me. As I took what would be my last shallow breath, I strangely found a degree of solace in knowing my reign of terror had been brought to a conclusive end. Now my only hope is that God will forgive me for being crazy as hell.